Good morning and what, happy Sabbath, Woodside Church family. This is actually afternoon, first time that I've done it on Sabbath afternoon, uh, but I was away all week at a youth trip for the academy on the houseboat in Shasta Lake, and we had some great ministry experiences there, and we're able to share with the kids. The youth pastor from Carmichael was doing a study on hearing God, and understanding his frequency, how to know when we're hearing from him and not from something else, so that was a great week. And so uh, today I welcome you as we look at how grace and the Christian life urge us on towards a whole full life. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Dear God in heaven, we thank you so much for your word and its transformative power and the grace that it affords us. Dear Lord, as we open your word today, help us to understand our need of you and depend on you for the fruit of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China. And in his uh, very famous ministry, he said to uh, some of those in his congregation, if your cat and your dog and if your children and if your husband and your wife are not better people for you being around, there may just be not enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian. What Paul writes to the church in Galatia in chapters 5 and 6 of his epistle, very similar to this context, because grace should positively impact the Christian life. Grace should positively impact the Christian life, and it should be a benefit to those around the Christian. You see in chapters 1 and 2 of this important epistle written about 49-50 AD to the region of Galatia, which is now modern-day Turkey and other parts of Asia. The church was struggling with that balance between legalism and license. On one hand, you have those that wanted to make those new Christians who were Gentiles, wanted to make them Jews by taking the rite of circumcision. And there were those that wanted to claim freedom, 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 and not show any of the fruits of the Spirit. And Paul, in, in chapter 1, he defends his ministry as someone who came from someone who was a persecutor to someone who was persecuted. And in chapter 2, he talks about the Council of Jerusalem. And now, they, at, as a church, they had resolved to welcome Gentiles in without circumcision and give them a few caveats about interrelating to the culture that they were in so that they would live a Christian life. And he concludes by calling out one of the church leaders in that area for showing bias and prejudice against those Gentiles. Touchstone verse for Galatians 2 is verses 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Last week, we talked about how it's not an either-or proposition between grace and law. It is a both-and connection, because the law shows us our need of the grace of God. And in chapters 3 and 4, Paul makes that case, that even Abraham didn't keep all of the laws, Yet it was the covenant with this promised son that was the key. And it was the faith that Abraham had, Abraham had in Christ, in Jesus, and in, in the Lord that secured his righteousness. In chapters 5 and 6 now, we are considering the Christian life. And he begins chapter 5 by asking or saying this statement, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. In verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. This is his encouragement away from legalism. This is his encouragement away from this ritualistic emphasis on doing something to merit God's favor, which we cannot do. Very very plain on that, especially as he talks about it in 
verses 13 and 14, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What a priority that he sets forth before the church. And he's really uh, coagulating what Jesus has said throughout his whole entire ministry. And he's emphasizing that this type of love that we have for our neighbor is only empowered by the grace that God affords us. You see, when they ask Jesus, in the context of who it was that was his neighbor, he, he asked and he told them a story about an ironic person, someone called the good Samaritan, which for the Jews was anathema. The Samaritans were dogs. They were not uh, authentic Jews. They were assimilated into the region by the Assyrians, and they were not worthy of the grace of God. But in Jesus' parable, the man who was supposedly outside of the kingdom of heaven ends up being the exemplar. So Paul emphasizes that the whole law is completed in this commandment of you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. I believe that what we have here is Paul's urgency regarding their crisis of relationship. What was happening in this church is that people were withdrawing because of the turmoil and the crisis that were happening because of this imbalance between legalism and license and the crisis of relationship is one of the reasons why people withdraw from the church other people withdraw because there is a crisis in leadership there was a decision that was made and they were not brought on board or they didn't agree with the decision they didn't like how the decision was made and so they withdrew crisis of relationship crisis of leadership other people withdraw because the church begins to not synchronize with their understanding of the Bible. It's a doctrinal crisis. And it happens when people are seeing or reading from something from the pulpit or reading or seeing something in small groups. It does not necessarily synchronize with their convictions. And so the third one is the crisis of doctrine. And the fourth one here, as Paul points out, is that the crisis of lifestyle will come in. You see, in verses 19 through 21, Paul shows the church in Galatia that they are not to have these crises of lifestyle ongoing. But when someone does exhibit this crisis of lifestyle, we are to show them love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against, against such things, there is no law. These things that he calls deeds of the flesh, are usually what we consider crisis of lifestyle. But we cannot uphold the church as a bastion for wellness. Because if it was, people would not come to the church because they would feel like they are not good enough. The church is a hospital for sick sinners, a place of salvation for souls that are in great need of his forgiveness. And a church is a community of believers that ex have experienced his grace and transformed their lives and are exhibiting these characteristics in verses 22 through 23 of Galatians. We think of them as the fruit of the Spirit, and they're empowered to the Christian based on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in verses 24 and 25. Now these who belong to Christ... Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This is the conviction of the Christian life. You see, it is a community of faith that bears one another's burdens in a trusted relationship. In this book, Speed of Trust, the author proposes that in the business world and in relationships, Trust enhances not only the economics of the project, but the timeline is truncated. In other words, if speed of trust is high, the project is done under budget and ahead of schedule. But if trust is low, then the budget's usually blown and the timeline can be tossed out the window because trust is crucial within a community. And I would enhance that even in a community of faith that is even more important. 
And that's why he's talking about here, bearing one another's burdens and thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. This trust that is exhibited is is important because of the confidence that our people place in us as spiritual leaders and as a spiritual community. You see, this context of the Christian life is motivated by the grace that God exhibits to us. It says here in verse 9, chapter 6, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Our Christian community in the context of Paul's urgency is a community that devoted itself to good works. Not because there was an urgency to please God, but because it was a compelling motivation to fulfill God's character and exhibit him to the world and exhibit him to our community. Paul closes chapter six by this phrase, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. You know, the epilogue on the church at Galatia is actually quite astounding. By the 1920s, the church had grown to millions and it had been ended up being 20% of the population there in Turkey. But the devil had great inroads. And by the time that the genocides were all done, Turkey had about 5% of Christians in its population. It's a very sad epilogue. But Paul's, Paul's letter to the Galatians is the only record that we have of his urgency to that region. There's no two Galatians, there's there's no three Galatians like it is in other epistles. So we have to understand and we have to assume that Paul and his encouragement was taken to heart and the church in Galatia understood that there was a balance between legalism and license. And that balance comes within fulfilling the law of Christ by loving your neighbor as yourself. This is our great appeal and this is our great urgency. Jesus even said it in the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. By so doing, you fulfill all of the law and the prophets. How is it that you could improve your love for your neighbor, friends? How is it that you can fulfill the law? You know, your love for God may be equal to the person that you love the least in this world. Because of 1 John 4.20. What John writes to the church, lay in the experience of the church, he tells them, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brothers and sisters also. And so when we consider this epistle to the Galatians and Consider that grace and love go together. Grace and the law go together. It's a both and proposition. And grace informs the Christian life and the Christian experience. Is that your desire today, friends? Is that your desire to have a faithful Christian life and a faithful Christian walk of fulfilling the law of Christ and exhibiting his character to the world? If that is your desire, I ask you to bow your heads with me in a prayer as we seek the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this epistle to the Galatians and for the understanding of the balance between license and legalism. We ask that your will would be done in our lives today, that we may both fulfill your law by loving one another as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, my friends. I pray that you'll have a wonderful week. Amen.